Paris or Glasgow, much less COP27. No, the science is telling us clearly where we need to be and where we are, and we're not where we need to be. We, have, we are falling um, short. But what we need to be doing, and this phase, this era of implementation, speaks about what, you know, where we see action um, with everybody, um, you know, everywhere across the globe, um, whether it is countries, whether it's companies, whether it's communities, whether it's with individuals, a clear shift in approach and doing everything that is possible. And that has to be done every single day. The urgency of where we are, you know, we cannot afford to lose um, you know, a day in this. Right. We have to cut emissions by half within the next eight years. It is a mammoth task ahead of us, but what the science also tells us, all of those reports tell us, the prescriptions of what we need to do, when we need to do it, is clearly prescribed. What is lacking is the collective um, actions of all parties at this time. The US climate envoy, John Kerry, told me the other day in relation to some of the fears coming out of, uh, of, of you know, Russia and Ukraine, and we can talk about that, uh, that this is akin to a thermonuclear explosion waiting to happen. Listen to what he said to me. Well, in a, in a, in a terrible way, Christiane, uh, we're, we're undergoing a sort of slow, long kind of nuclear war with what's happening with the climate. It is devastating. And many of the impacts that we're living through today are irreversible. I mean, some of the top scientists that I rely on, uh, and one in particular, Johan Rockström of the Potsdam Institute, will say that, uh, that, that we've reached a point where perhaps five separate tracks are now uh, the tipping points. They've tipped. Mm -hmm. They've tipped. Arctic, Antarctic, Barents Sea, uh, the uh, coral reefs, and permafrost. So I want to just ask you, for one ray of hope that you have, is it, in fact, out of the Ukraine war that may accelerate countries, you know, necessity to find sustainable alternatives? Where is one ray of hope that you see right now? We have seen backtracking um, due to the, um, the global energy crisis. But what we've also heard from some of those developed world parties is their commitment to double down on accelerating the transition to renewables. And the statistics are showing that over this crisis period, um, record high levels of investment in, um, in the renewable energy sectors. So there are glimmers of hope. The technology is there. The price points um, to make this commercially feasible are there. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing some incredible um, uh, as a developments um, on that front. But what we need to see is more of that. We also need to see a deceleration of um, activities, whether it's coal and um, whether it's other fossil fuels and the accelerated phase out of that um, across the globe. And coming out of Glasgow with the historic um, agreement of the phasing down of coal, it wasn't the phasing out that we wanted to see, but to have that in a um, an international agreement signals the recognition um, across parties of the need for this shift. Can, can I ask you something? More yeah, yeah, can I ask you something? The International Energy Agency says the fossil fuel sector is expected to mass four trillion dollars in 2022. And this past week, or these past weeks, including as we speak, uh, energy companies like BP, you know, Shell, Total, all these other ones are reporting you know, I mean, massive 
profits, billions and billions of dollars of, of extra profits, even over and above what they experienced before, obviously because of what's going on with the rising prices of, of, of oil. Now, Professor Miles Allen at the Oxford University told The Guardian newspaper this, the combined profits, taxes and royalties generated by the oil and gas industry over the past few months would be enough to capture every single molecule of CO2, carbon dioxide, produced by their activities and re-inject it back underground. So why are we only talking about transforming society and not about obliging a highly profitable industry to clean up the mess caused by the product it sells? Do you agree with that? Is it actually time to get serious with these companies? Science is clear. And those that are responsible for um, the continuation of activities that are detrimental um, to our environment, um, that are at the root cause um, of climate change, um, have to be addressed. One of the reasons why the Secretary General made the call recently that there should be windfall taxes on energy companies and those um, resources channeled into um, whether it's loss and damage, um, whether it is other facilities that are going to assist the most vulnerable. Everything that is done, again, whether it is at a national level, whether it's in, in company boardrooms, um, has to be, has to be uh, Paris aligned. And in terms of the investments and the financial uh, community, the um, private finance, investments there need to be channeled through to the transition that is needed to address the climate crisis. So I hear you loud and clear, and the UN Secretary General himself has said, as you, as you correctly point out, this fact. And yet, these companies many would say, are involved in greenwashing. They talk a good game. Every time we interview them, they say, but look what we're doing. We're doing this and we're doing that and we're plowing this back into alternative research. But it is a process and we have to let, you know, let all this play out before we can actually see, you know, see, uh, see a change in what we do. Are you, are you convinced at all that you can convince these people to do what this professor says, plow back their incredible profits into sinking CO2 underground? Well, coming out of, uh, out of this COP will be the presentation of high-level experts and group findings, which will start the process of holding to account um, all of those pledges um, that we heard last year in Glasgow, $139 trillion worth um, of, of, of pledges. And sifting through those that are genuinely uh, net zero um, aligned, those that aren't, and to start putting frameworks in place which hold companies and entities to account. Mm -hmm. And one of the roles of the UNFCCC moving forward um, will be there as a, an accountability uh, entity that is monitoring that is tracking and that will be holding um, companies, entities to account, which is absolutely critical if we're to focus in on those that are performing and doing what they're supposed to do and those that aren't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the